Brothers and sisters, it's really good to be with you again. I'm pleased that uh, I was asked to say a few words about the Book of Mormon, particularly Alma 39 through 42. Some of my favorite chapters in the Book of Mormon. In fact, I think that uh, uh, those chapters give, other than a two or three other places, give more doctrine, solid doctrine, than any other place in the Book of Mormon. I am sorry that Alma had some issues with his son Corianton. I'm grateful that he blessed us with giving us a report of what he did about his son Corianton. Perhaps it was possible that Corianton uh, not, did not just abandon his ministry, but that he may have been influenced by some Zoramite ideas. And perhaps some of these ideas are what Alma is addressing in these chapters. I'd like to, though, begin with an irreverent joke that I've probably told more times than I should have. Uh, and that is, what's the difference between teaching a primary class and teaching gospel doctrine? And most, many of you already know the answer is that in a primary class, you can do some good. Well, I want to illustrate that point here. Uh, probably 18 years ago, 19 years ago, I had just finished teaching a primary class in which um, Coach Croton's son was, was uh, one of the members of the class. And it was the year that they turn eight. So it's the year that they all get baptized. It's my favorite class to teach that year when they get baptized. And uh, <clears throat> this particular incident happened in January after the year that I taught uh, the little Croton boy and the other ones in that class. It was a great class, those kids. And my wife and I had just set off to get to go to work at BYU in the car and she had forgotten something and made me turn around and come and park in front of our house. And I stopped there and uh, she ran in the house to get what she had forgotten. And the little Croton boy who was at the bus stop next door to our house where the Gillespie's now live, uh, came trotting over to my car and I rolled down the window. It was winter and he had on his big coat and it was cold outside and he said, Brother Hoskison, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, some people say that God knows everything. Do you believe that? Well, I kind of taught him that in the class and so I had to confess, yes, I, I, I think God knows everything. And then he said, does he know where I'm going to go after this life? And I said to him, well, I think so. I think he knows everything. And then he astonished me with his next question. His next question was, then why did he send us here to the earth if he already knows? I could have given him a long answer, a philosophical answer, an obtuse answer. But I gave him a simple one, which I think is the only right answer. I asked him, who doesn't know where you're going to go? He thought about it for a minute or two and he says, I don't. I said, yep, yeah, that's right. That's why God sent you here. <laughs> he got a big smile on his face and he trotted off to the bus stop again. My wife came and I went to work and I thought to myself, as I was driving away, wow. There's another one who will make a great university professor. He's already thinking at the, at the age of nine, January, at the bus stop. Cool. Well, to go along with that, I watched a video yesterday of Elder Betnar speaking to an audience. I don't know even know who the audience was. Uh, I was obviously speaking to a Spanish audience because uh, uh, every phrase that he would speak, would, he would pause and it would be translated into Spanish. But it was an excerpt, I suppose. I, I, I'm sure it wasn't, the, all I watched was not the whole talk. But uh, he began by saying, you don't have to die to find out which kingdom you're going to. You already know today. And then he 
translated into Spanish. And then he went on to say, if you're struggling to live the gospel of Jesus Christ and you feel like the restraints on it are, are, are taking away your freedom and your ability to enjoy life, I can promise you, you're going to spend eternity with people who are struggling to live the gospel. If in this life you are joyfully living the gospel, it's a real pleasure to you to keep the commandments, to try and obey God. You will spend eternity with others who find a great joy in serving God and keeping all the commandments. The Lord will not have to tell us where we're going when we get to the judgment bar, because you will know already by the time you get there where you're going to be the happiest. It'll be with people like yourself. In fact, I used to joke with my students at BYU. Heaven it can be defined by saying it's being with other people like yourself. And conversely, hell is being with other people like yourself. All you have to do is to look at yourself today and you know which kingdom you're going to. You don't have to wait until you die, as Ola Bednar said. So, let's dive into a little bit of what Alma said to his son Corianton about the resurrection. I think there's some wonderful things here. Apparently, Corianton had a couple of issues. Let me mention two. Uh, one of them is, when do you resurrect? And the second one is, is it just of God to condemn the sinner for eternity? I'm going to mix up my answers to both of these, Alma's answers to both of these problems. But the first one, let's look at it. When do people resurrect? In Alma chapter 40, verse 5, it says, it doesn't matter when they resurrect. It's, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, and he doesn't quite get around to answering that question exactly. But he, he says it's his opinion that those who lived before the time of Christ will resurrect before those who lived after the time of Christ. In general, I'm sure that's no doubt true. But again, uh, he, he also says those who are righteous will be resurrected before those who are wicked. And I think that also is generally true. In fact, that may be one of the reasons uh, for we're saying there's a first and a second, not a, not a first, a second. In fact, the scriptures only mention a first resurrection and a last resurrection. They never mention anything in between. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but the scriptures never talk about them. Now, the reason it really doesn't matter very much is also stated in Alma chapter 40, verse 8, where it says, All things are as one day to God. Time only is measured unto man. In other words, asking God when the resurrection is, is an irrelevant question. Because it's a question that only comes out of mortality. When is the time? You know, it's only in mortality that we have time as we understand it. In eternity, there's no time as we understand it. And so we often ask irrelevant questions based on our experiences here in mortality. And that one, when is the resurrection, is a totally irrelevant one. There is a resurrection. Possibly those who are righteous will be resurrected first. Possibly those who are less righteous will be resurrected last. And it doesn't matter when the resurrection is. One iota. Now, the Book of Mormon also makes it very clear. Uh, for instance, in, in 2 Nephi chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, that in the resurrection at the resurrection, you will either be righteous still, or you'll be filthy still. It's a binary. You're either righteous or you're filthy, which is probably one of the reasons why the Book of Mormon seldom talks, or never actually talks, about the three degrees of glory. Because for the Book of Mormon, all of the kingdoms are kingdoms of glory, as the Doctrine and Covenant says also. All of those kingdoms are kingdoms of glory. You either resurrect to a kingdom of glory, or you resurrect to outer darkness. It's binary. So, how do we, what determines which kingdom we get to then? Uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, by the time we get to the resurrection, 
uh, all of the ordinances will be taken care of. There will never be a question about, were you baptized? Were you ordained? Were you sealed? Etc. Because those ordinances will have been performed for every son and daughter of our father and mother. The question that will be asked at the resurrection, if there's any questions at all, I'm sometimes beginning to wonder like whether there will be, else, be any questions. Did you receive the Holy Ghost as you were commanded to when you were confirmed a member of the church? Or did you live up to the promise you made to be true and faithful to your spouse? Did you live up to all the ordinances and promises that you made in the sacred temples of our Lord. It's not a matter of, did I get baptized? It's a matter of, did you live up to your baptism? And on that question, I think uh, 2 Nephi chapter 9, right around verse 14, isn't it? It says, we will have a perfect knowledge of our guilt or our righteousness. Now, one of the things I think I want to stress here, and this is not necessarily from the Book of Mormon, uh, although I will quote the Book of Mormon, uh, as I said earlier, we like to extrapolate from our experiences here in mortality what it's going to be like in eternities. And some of that works, and probably a lot of it doesn't work. Often our imagination pictures the final judgment as a courtroom scene, like we would see on Perry Mason or on the other TV shows, or maybe some of you have even been in a courtroom situation where there's a judge, there's a att prosecuting attorney, a defense attorney, they have witnesses called, and they try and prove the guilt or the innocence of somebody. I don't think the final judgment is going to be anything at all like that. Alma chapter 41, verse 7. We are our own judge, whether we do evil or do good. And we will have a perfect knowledge of that at the judgment day. There's not going to be a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney. In fact, I think the only thing that will happen is that we will stand there before our loving Father in heaven. And we will simply say, as it says in 2 Nephi 9, verse 46, Holy, holy, holy are thy judgments, Lord God Almighty. But I know my guilt. And I can picture myself, if I extrapolate, saying, I know where I belong. Thanks, Father. It's been a good trip, but I'm going where I belong. And I'm going to be really happy there, wherever it is. Of course, I would know where it is. In fact, I think all of us know where it is right now, in this life. That's all I've been nice said. Now, to help us in this situation, you're either clean or filthy when you get to the resurrection. And as Alma explains to San Corianton, who's troubled by this, there is a time given to us after this life when we can fix all of the problems we didn't get around to fixing in this life. All of us are trying to repent in this life, trying to become righteous, trying to become clean and pure and holy. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't. But most of us, I believe, are really trying hard. And some things we just never can fix in this life. It just is almost impossible because we're just mortals. We're imperfect. And some of us have other issues, some, some chemical imbalances or some social issues, whatever. It doesn't matter. Because if we don't get things fixed in this life and we're trying to get them fixed, we get that chance in the spirit world, as Alma explains to Corianton. All of the issues that you couldn't get fixed in this life, they'll be taken care of there in that life as you continue to repent and try and fix things. Whether they're self-inflicted wounds, sins that we choose to commit, as I joked last time, um, our favorite sins are the only ones we have left. And we've got to work on those too. I hope I don't have to wait until the spirit world to get rid of some of those. But we can work on them there. So we can get rid of all those self-inflicted wounds in the spirit world. We can also get rid of all the wounds that we had 
no part in in the spirit world. If we're born with this deformity, if we're born with that uh, mental handicap, if we're, if we're born with a tendency because of our genes to do X, Y, or Z, all of that will be removed in the spirit world. And we, because of the ordinances that we have received, personally or vicariously, will be cleansed by the Savior Jesus Christ. If we have repented and if we have tried to make things right. And so by the time we resurrect, according to Alma, we will be clean and righteous and pure or not. Now, even the Doctrine and Covenants says that those who go to the Telestial Kingdom have become righteous. And they enter a kingdom of glory. Now, there's the apocryphal story about Joseph Smith saying, if we could only see the glorious nature of the Telestial Kingdom, we would die to get there. Well, I had a friend once who really knew a lot about the Gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I think he was one of the world's experts on the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon, both. He really knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet of, the God, of God, but he wasn't a member of the church. So I asked him one day when we were talking at the library at BYU, you know the church is true? He says, yes. You know Joseph was a prophet, don't you? Yes, I do. You know the Book of Mormon is true? Oh, yes. You know the Pearl of Great Price is, is what it says it is? He, oh, yes, I know it is. I said, then why don't you get baptized? And he said, uh, my goal is to get to the terrestrial kingdom, and I don't need the church for that. And at the time I thought, oh, well, all right. But I, you know, through the years, it just occurred to me, he's being a little bit short-sighted. I think he would really like to be in the celestial kingdom. I wonder how many of us sell ourselves short also. As Elder Bednar said, we don't need to die to find out where we're going. We already know. Just look at what you're, where you're comfortable, where you're happy, and what you love to do. I think that's part of what Elder or what um, Alma was telling us in Coranton. Coranton, you're not going to be happy doing this. If you'll straighten yourself out, you'll be happy. You'll know it's true. You will be resurrected. I am grateful for this knowledge. Let me quote in closing from Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, verses 22 through 24. For he who is not able to abide the law of the celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. In fact, let me paraphrase that, which is what I think it means. For he, is not a, for he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom in this life cannot abide a celestial glory. And he who cannot abide the law of a terrestrial kingdom in this life cannot abide a terrestrial glory. And he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom in this life cannot abide a telestial glory. Therefore, he is not meet for a kingdom of glory. Therefore, he must abide a kingdom which is not a kingdom of glory. It really is binary. You either get glory or you don't. As for me and my house, I hope we can qualify for the celestial kingdom. That's my goal. I want to be together as a family. I want to have that kind of loving and, and supportive uh, companionship that I think belongs in the celestial kingdom. I can't imagine how glorious and beautiful it will be, but I think I would enjoy it. And I'm grateful for Alma teaching his son Corianton about the resurrection. And by the way, it's the only scripture that ties re resurrection with the word restoration. And of course, he makes it very clear to his son. When you are resurrected, you are restored to that which you already had, except it'll be a fullness of it. I'm grateful for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.